Hey, we are in a brand new series called Forgiveness Understood. Forgiveness Understood. It's one of those things and, uh, that I was praying about this year. I was, I was very upset about 2020. I was very upset because I felt like a lot of prayers seemingly went unanswered. I felt like in 2020, heaven was strangely silent in, in my prayer life. And I'm just being for real, okay? Can I just be for real? Can I just tell you guys, like, I was aggravated with the church world at large. Uh, a lot of people just uh, not, not shutting down their churches, but just having no vision for how are we gonna get through this? How are we gonna move forward? And, and I began to ask God, like, um, what's the next move of your spirit? What's the next big thing that you're going to do? And throughout 2020, all I kept hearing from evangelical pastors was that there was a judgment of God coming. And I have a problem with that. I have a problem with people excited about the judgment of God. Think about that for a second. How masochistic are you? That you think you have the answer and everyone else is getting judged. Come on, somebody. Be very careful about that, okay? Okay because I'm sure there's some things that you would not want me to find on your internet history, all right? I'm just saying, if any move of God was about judgment, then what did Jesus Christ do on the cross? Then, then when Jesus says, it is finished, it wasn't actually finished. It was circumstantially finished. Come on, somebody. It can't be about more judgment. And I believe that God dropped something into my spirit. That the next move we're gonna see, because we just came through what was called like a grace revolution. The, the, the idea and learning about grace was a move that just happened. I believe that God dropped this into my spirit. That the last act in the screenplay of life was gonna be forgiveness. Forgiveness. A move of forgiveness in the hearts of believers. Forgiveness would be the last act in the screenplay of life. In mm. fact, Jesus said it himself as his last act. His last act of God-man was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So let's start today by talking about you. And I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but I want you to self-inventory. Has Something ever happened to you that made you lose your cool? Has something ever happened to you that just ticked you off? Huh? You ever lost your cool? Has something ever happened to you that you lost your cool in such a way that you let words come out of your mouth that weren't so holy? Words that you don't really find in the Bible? Hey, Baba. I ain't talking about speaking in tongues either, huh? <laughs> Have you ever got so angry that like really, really bad words ever came out of your mouth? See, nobody wants to agree with that. One. Nobody wants to say amen. <laughs> Is this a setup? <laughs> we have a series called Forgiveness Understood but we're also playing on the first two letters of forgiveness and understood. Has anybody ever made you so mad that you just wanted to say those two letters to them? And, and we're talking about the explicit of it. Come on. What you were feeling, if you ever got to that place, and listen, I promise you, I will not cuss. I will not cuss this whole series, I promise you, okay? I won't. <laughs> My staff had to warn me. <laughs> but if you've ever gotten to that place where you wanted to say, forget you to somebody, what you were experiencing and what you were feeling was the fact that you were offended. You were offended. They did something, they said something, a situation happened that offended you. You took offense to a situation. And it's happening every single day on social media. I think it's one of those things like we just love being offended. If we didn't love being offended, 
we would just stop scrolling through certain people's social media. If we didn't love being offended, we would just unfollow them so their stuff didn't pop up on our feed. But no, but, but why would it? Okay, whatever, I don't even wanna get on that. There are millions of ways to be offended today, especially in today's climate. In today's climate, do you guys get what I'm saying? What's happening on the news, what we can see? We can be offended about anything. And I've met people recently who simply love being offended. They look for the next thing to be offended about as if it's their mission in life to live offended. And I just think to myself, how much stress is that? How anxiety provoking is that? The need to keep looking for the next offense. And I just wanna ask this question today, and don't answer, and don't hit your spouse. Maybe you're watching online, don't hit your spouse at home. Are you a person who is easily offended? Are you a person who's easily offended? If someone says something stupid, do you have to respond? Do you have to respond? Because that's a tendency of offense, the need to say something. I wanna say this to you today, it's kind of the idea that we're gonna build throughout this series. Offense is the cage that keeps you in bondage. Offense is the cage, just think of it as a offense, a fence, okay, a fence. So instead of offense, a fence, a cage. Offense is a cage that locks you in bondage. You are bound to that thing. Once you enter the cage of offense, you normally find yourself stuck in the bondage of unforgiveness for quite a while, for quite a while. Once the chains of unforgiveness bind themselves to you, it can become very difficult to pick the lock and get those chains off. A lot of the things that we deal with today as older adults in our lives are in response to a negative situation that happened to us as a child or as a teenager or as a, as a young single person or as a married person, right? You, if you are in your second or third marriage, you, you filter everything that's happening to you in this new relationship based upon what happened in the previous relationship. If you dated a lot of people before marriage, you're going through all those people that you dated and filtering what's this spouse doing, saying, acting in comparison to everything that I've already experienced. And there can be these chains that hold us and lock us in this cage of offense called unforgiveness. Today, I don't wanna to get too deep into psychology, but I want to talk about the psychology of forgiveness. And the psychology of forgiveness will set us up very nicely for this entire series, okay? Because I believe why we carry around unforgiveness is because forgiveness is not understood. Forgiveness is simply not understood. So today, we're gonna talk about another FU topic, feelings under, undef, undefined, feelings undefined, feelings undefined. Have you ever felt something, but you didn't know how to define it? No, never? Okay, I'm gonna give you an example. And I, I'm probably gonna be all over my notes, so if this doesn't make any sense, just go back and re-scramble it when you get home. As a child, my, a lot of people called me very angry, an angry child, an angry teenager. And so I thought that I was acting and behaving in a way that was anger. But really, and, and I didn't understand until I got older, really, I was just easily embarrassed. I was easily embarrassed. Anybody in here easily embarrassed? Nobody. See, you don't even wanna raise your hand because you know I'm gonna make you stand up in front of everybody. No. 
I was easily embarrassed. Everything embarrassed me, right? And because I could sing and I could act and stuff like that, my parents would always, like at family dinners, Mike, come out here and do that song. And then I would like shut down. And I would, no, I can't do it. And then my dad would get upset at me. And then like, then I'd even shut down even more. And then I would get lashed out in anger. Why are you so angry? But I wasn't angry, I was embarrassed. And so I began to define every time I felt embarrassed as anger. My feelings were defined incorrectly. We're gonna get to this today, okay? While it's very easy to passively forgive an offender, simply saying, I forgive you, the challenge comes, listen to me here, the challenge comes when you are reminded of their offense every time you see them. It's easy to stand up in a church and say, we've got to forgive our brothers. Got to forgive our sisters. That's easy. What's tough is I'm going to have to see them again. They borrowed money from me. They didn't pay me back. And I'm going to have to see them again. That's where the challenge comes. Do I feel something the next time I see them? Although I have forgiven them. It's, it's very hard. Come on, somebody. It's very hard to get rid of a negative memory. That's why. Throw this out there to you. That's why. When you look for a product on Amazon to buy, you don't look at the 10,000 five-star reviews. You go look at the three one-stars. What is wrong with you? Do you want to buy the product or not? But you go look for the review to tell you not to buy it, and then you're going to buy it anyway. <laughs> I should have listened to the reviews, right? Come on, come on. We have this, this draw to negative memory. We have this addiction to negative memory. Sometimes these reoccurring memories and feelings make you question whether you actually forgave the person or not. Now, I'm gonna say this to you. I have taught that. And I believed it, that if I saw you and I still felt something, then I didn't actually forgive you. I taught that. Thankfully, listen to me right now, thankfully, the Bible commands us to forgive. It doesn't necessarily command us to forget. Because listen, because listen, God knows how our brains work. He knows how our brains work. Our brains work in such a way they're so beautifully designed. It re your brain remembers everything that goes into it. You just don't know how to recall it all the time. This is why there can be major disconnects between something that happened to you as a child and then remembering it when you're 20, 30 years old. It was there, but your brain somehow protected you from that memory. Listen to what I'm saying. We're commanded to forgive. We're not commanded to forget. Now, Pastor Mike, shouldn't we forget? That would be, that would be brilliant. That would be ideal. But I was guilty of locking myself in another bondage that said, I didn't forgive because I still have feelings. I didn't forgive because I can still remember it. And I put myself in this box like, oh my gosh, how do I get free of my own brain of remembering? But I wasn't commanded to do that. I wasn't commanded to be devoid of all feeling. I wasn't commanded to be void of all memory. I was commanded to make a decision that no matter what I feel, no matter what I remember, no matter what I went through, I will forgive. That's the command. 
That's the command. Because I don't have to forget all the good things that happened. I don't have to forget good experiences. Come on. So it's extremely hard, if not impossible, to forget the hurts that have happened to us. You have never forgotten touching a hot stove. You haven't. Now, again, maybe the exact scenario of when you were a kid and you touched the hot stove isn't really there, like you don't think about it, but you don't touch a hot stove. You don't do it because you learned it. Listen to what I'm saying to you today. It's very, very hard, if not impossible, for humanity to forget wrongdoings done to us, things that hurt us. But you know what? It's actually very simple for God to do. The thing that's almost impossible for us, God has made a decision to do it, and he does it all the time. He forgets. God can't forget. Oh, oh, he chooses to. He chooses, all right, Jeremiah 31, 34. Put it up on the screen. I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. He didn't say, you know what, I am just so absent-minded, <laughs> I didn't even remember that. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I'm making a decision. I'm making a promise to you. I will forgive your sin, and I will, I will, I choose. I will not remember it anymore. I will not hold it against you. It will not be something I play over in my mind every time I see you. Listen, you messed up, and then you come and ask me to bless you. I'm not going to hold it against you. When I was a kid, I've told this story a lot. When I was a kid, I threw my Frisbee, I was really practicing Frisbee, and I threw it as hard as I could, and the wind caught it, and it went up in the air and landed on the roof of the house. My like, man, how am I gonna get my Frisbee off the roof of the house? Well, I'm very industrious. I figure out ways to do it. I went and got a slingshot, okay? We know one of the ones that wrap around your wrist, it's got the rubber, you know, it, it was a nice one. Go get my slingshot, and we lived in a cul-de-sac that had gravel in it in Scotchtown. So I went and grabbed a pocket full of stones. I thought I was David, you know? Got a pocket full of stones, and I'm sitting there, and I'm like, pow, pow. I'm, I'm hitting the roof. I'm missing, but I'm like, man, I can get this. And I take a, like, a little bit bigger rock, because I'm like, maybe this doesn't have enough weight. And because I had a bigger rock, it didn't fly as high. I hit our four-foot-by-four-foot four picture window in the front of the house and just shattered it, shattered the window. And if you're like me, there's only one response to that. Run! Oh my God, I took my slingshot, I threw it in the garbage can, I ran around the back of the house and I was like chilling on the back porch. My dad happened to be, in, my dad was actually standing in the family room, like in the living room, saw the whole thing happen as the rock came right at him. So I wasn't fooling him. What happened to the window? I don't know. <laughs> it was a whole situation. So in that exact moment, I did not have any confidence to ask my dad to take me shopping for a new pair of jeans. I didn't have confidence to ask him, hey dad, can we go get ice cream now? I had no confidence to ask him anything because I knew what I just did. What I didn't know was the love of a father until I became a father. That even in the midst of me breaking like a $200 window, which was a lot of money back then, if I needed a pair of jeans for school the next day, in the midst of that, my dad would have still taken me to the store, bought me the jeans that I needed because it was his position as a father to provide for his children. Now listen, I'm sorry if you weren't raised that way. I'm sorry that, I'm sorry of that. But that should be the way it is. And if my dad, being evil, and dad, if you're watching, I'm not actually calling you evil, but you get what I'm saying, because you, you preached this before, you understand this. And if my dad being evil 
would treat me and love me that way, how much more would my Father in heaven, even in the midst of my worst decisions, love me, care for me, and provide for me? Watch this, the psalmist David said it so beautifully in Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. This is key. This is key. This is where you have to get it. This is, this is forgiveness understood right here. Ready? God separates the offense from the offender. This is why it's very difficult for you to forgive somebody. This is why it's very difficult. Because we have a hard time separating the offense from the offender. We identify the offender with the offense instead of them being a broken soul just like you. God separates the offense from the offender. But on the human level, this can almost feel impossible because we remember what someone did to hurt us. They did that. And so we attach the behavior with the person instead of separating the two. Come on, this is, this is, this is key. This is it. This is, this is the beginning of it. Though, it's not always a sign of unforgiveness that you still feel it because... The offense might just be the most vivid memory that you have of that individual. Think back to your upbringing. What's the most vivid memory you have of your parents? Was that a good memory or a bad memory? Whatever it is, it just, it, it, it just is. It just is. And, and that's what happens, is when we put the definitions on, this was a good thing, this was a bad thing. We begin to define these things. The letters F-U, they just are two letters. They're just two letters in a specific order. But now you define that based on what you want those two letters to mean. So now it's offensive that you would say F-U in the house of God. I'm saying forgiveness understood. What are you talking about? When I was a kid, my dad and I would wrestle. I loved wrestling my dad. It always ended the same way. Me, hurt, and crying. <laughs> Every single time. But I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because my initial response to pain is laughing, is laughing. So me and my dad would be wrestling, he'd have me in a hold or he'd put my arm behind my back or he'd have me like curled up in a, in a, in a Nelson or something like that, right? And I, because <laughs> it's hurting. So he'd go a little bit more because my son's having fun. This is exciting to him. And I wasn't giving up. So you go a little bit more. Then that laughter turned to, <laughs> pop my shoulder out of the socket. No, he didn't do that, but. <laughs> His definition of what was happening was my son is enjoying this. Same stimulus to pain. It was the same pain, but I was laughing to it. A little further, I was crying to it. You experiencing the same thing may have never laughed at it, but maybe always cried to it. It's what, it's what you, how you choose to respond to the same stimulus. It just is. It just is. What might be pain to you might be pleasure to somebody else. It just is. It's just stimulus but then you begin to put definitions on those things. And let me tell you, you might be defining things incorrectly. You might be incorrectly defining what's happening in your life. The psychology of memory can explain why forgiving 
and forgetting is rarely the case. It's rarely the case. I, I, I really don't know anybody who's been through a traumatic experience, who has generally forgave somebody, but can't still recall all the details of the situation. And I will tell you, there's a difference between forgetting uh, let me say it like this. Maybe you can't forget, but you don't have to choose to keep remembering. Huh? Maybe I can't forget, but do I, do I have to keep replaying it every night before I go to bed? Do I have to keep going over the details? See, see that, that, that there's a difference there. No, maybe I can't forget it, but I don't have to keep putting that situation in the, man, I can't even say cassette deck, CD player, record player, the MP3 player of your memory life. Like, you don't have to keep replaying it. Our memories are so powerful, a single experience can become so entrenched in our memory that we use that one situation as a basis to judge every other experience in our life. So I don't wanna to get too deep in psychology, it's called confirmation bias. Somebody does something to us, it, it, it was traumatic, now it's the lens by which I see everything, you see, there it is. You should see you're doing it again, and you're doing it again, and you're doing it again, over and over and over again. One experience was true, it did happen, but now, I'm saying everything that happens to me is like this person. It's like this thing. And it may not be the case. God designed us with such precision that when a memory happens, it literally changes something in your brain. It puts a footprint. That memory is literally stamped into the programming of your brain. It literally wires your brain. I, I don't remember if it's white matter. I think it's white matter. It creates in your brain a brand new memory. Repeat that experience over and over and over again. It's like creating a new trail in the woods. There was no trail here, but the more we walked it, we matted all of the stuff down we now have a permanent trail that we can see something's been going down this road. That's what your memories do. The more you practice something in your mind, the more entrenched it becomes in your brain. The more you experience something over and over and over and over again, it becomes entrenched in your brain. See, so memory is biological and physiological. So what do we do if we need to forgive, but we're still remembering. I need to forgive, but I'm still remembering. A man named Kanayo wrote this. He said, a true sign of forgiveness is even when you remember their faults and offenses, you choose to say in your heart and in your mind, God's grace is bigger than what they did to me and how they made me feel. Oh yeah, but look at that. Why are you using church stuff? Listen, man, you have no hope outside of using God as a crutch. There is no hope outside of crutching up with God on both sides. Come on, somebody. I will use that crutch all day long. You have to make a decision in your heart and in your mind. I will separate the offense from the offender. Forgiveness, listen, forgiveness is you relating to someone according to their God-given identity. Forgiveness refuses to reduce people to their mistakes. Thank God I have not been reduced to the sum of my mistakes. Thank God. Thank God my value is not found in my behavior. 
Forgiveness refuses to reduce people to their mistakes, their shortcomings, their aliases, whatever you want to call it. Those things all hide their true identity and their worth. Forgiveness, listen to this, get this. Forgiveness is a weighty call to choose honor above vengeance. Choosing honor above vengeance. How hard today is it to choose honor in our climate that we live in? We have a saying here, we honor up, down, and all around. We want to choose honor. Now, it would be so wonderful if we had a sea of forgetfulness like God did. It says that when he, when he forgives you, he throws your transgression into the sea of forgetfulness. That would be wonderful. But we don't have that. So we have to make a conscious decision to forgive. We have to make a conscious decision. How are we going to respond to our memories that may try to come back at times when we see a person who offended us? A great way to do that is by creating new memories. Creating new memories. And I think that that's been the hardest thing of 2020 is that we got locked down, we got shut down, vacations canceled, and so we weren't out making new memories, we were just sitting, thinking about the old days, thinking about what it was like before masks, what it was like to meet somebody and see their teeth. God models this information of new memories so well. He forgives completely and does not get angry. Watch this, Micah 7, 18. Who is a God like you? I love that because he's writing in a time where there was multiple, multiple gods. We don't really see that as much today. We know that there's multiple religions, but we don't really see people pull out idols and statues and light incense. And He's saying straight up, who is a God like you? There's a lot of them out there, but who's one like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Although we cannot forget we can choose to not remember. We do not have to keep playing this thing over and over and over and over in our minds. I wanna describe this to you. He says, you will not stay angry forever. Micah was prophesying the coming of the Christ. He was prophesying the coming that there would be a day that all sin, all transgression, all bad behavior would be paid for on the cross, that God would take all of his anger towards sin and he would place it upon his son once and for all that Christ might say, it is finished. I want you to get this today. Forgiveness does not excuse the offender's behavior. Forgiveness excuses the offender. this will be the hardest thing you ever have to do in your life. Separating the offense from the offender because you want to hold them responsible. Do you want to be held responsible for every single thought that ever went through your mind? No, because God said, we want to sit back and judge somebody for their bad behavior, but you thought about it. You thought about doing the same thing. So you're guilty. I mean, if that's, if that's what you want to do, then you're just as guilty. That's what he's saying. We have to get to this place where we can separate the offense from the offender. Forgiveness does not excuse the behavior, but it excuses the person. Now watch. I can't do that because they hurt me. 
get this. I, I don't know if I can help trick your mind. Sin hurt you. Sin hurt you. The fall of humanity hurts you. This doesn't give somebody a pass. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But, but as a human being, they are still a valuable person in the world and in life. They chose to do something incorrect. Sin hurt you. The behavior hurt you. The sinfulness of humanity hurt you. The behavior is unacceptable, but the person can be forgiven. I can't do that. You have been forgiven all your sins. Now listen. Being forgiven of your sins does not make sinning okay. Being forgiven of your sin doesn't make sinning okay. Just as that person being forgiven for hurting me doesn't make what they did to me okay. I didn't say it was okay. I said they're forgiven. Forgiveness understood. I want to be forgiven. I want to be forgiven. I, I want to be forgiven so badly, I've got it tattooed on my arm, forgiven. And this is my cheat sheet. It's right here, because from the walk over there to the walk over here, I have to remind myself of this. The only thing that qualifies me to walk from there to here is forgiven. What I do with those feelings inside. You see, forgiveness can't be understood until feelings are defined. Feelings undefined keep, keep the sores of unforgiveness open. So what are you feeling? What are you feeling? There's a whole, I'm, I don't have time to get into feelings today. We're already over time. There are multiple charts on the internet, feelings charts, emotional charts. You start with the primary thing that you're showing. I'm showing anger, okay? If people said I'm acting a certain way, it's anger. Now we take that word anger and we begin to look at other subcategories of what, what would anger look like. So for me, inside of anger is embarrassment. And oh my gosh, okay, I'm actually embarrassed. Can I, can I act differently being embarrassed? Do I have to let it look like anger just because I'm embarrassed? And then I can begin to work on that feeling, on that emotion. In my life, I had a bad definition. I had a bad definition to my feeling. And so I kept living it over and over and over and over again. I want to point out something today. I want to close kind of with this idea. Forgiveness, I said it all the way in the beginning, forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is not a feeling. You're not gonna feel forgiven. You're not gonna feel like forgiving. It's a decision. Just like love. Love is not an emotion. Love is a decision that you make day in and day out. You may never feel forgiven. Doesn't mean you aren't. Your feelings can keep you in, bo in the bondage of unforgiveness. Opening the cage of forgiveness doesn't have to be done alone, though. 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, he says, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand. I mean, hey, that would be a great step to forgiving someone. Humble yourself. Because you, you could have hurt somebody, too. You probably did hurt somebody. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Here it is. Cast all your anxiety, cast all your feelings, cast all your emotions on him because he cares for you. Be free today. 
Be free today from the bondage of unforgiveness. And, he, and here, here's a hard one. We're gonna get into this uh, in two weeks. There's someone in here who you still have hatred towards someone who's already passed away. They're already dead. And every time you see a picture, every time their name comes up, you feel something. And you know that that feeling is because you have not forgiven. How do you forgive someone who's dead? You forgive them. You see, true forgiveness is when you make a decision that I don't have to get an apology. When you're waiting for the apology, then no, you can never forgive the dead. It's too late for that. But I can forgive them and I can release myself from the bondage of unforgiveness. Father, we thank you today that your word will never return to you void, but it will accomplish exactly what you said it for to Lord, I pray, even as there's tension in the room right now because we're talking about the feelings that we have towards somebody who hurt us, that God, we can make a decision to forgive. You said we can forgive because we have been so greatly forgiven. Those who do forgive understand that they have been forgiven much. Lord, help us to walk in that. Help us to walk in the liberty and the joy of the Lord that comes with forgiveness. I pray God today that we would accept your forgiveness, that we would accept your love in our lives, that we would see that we are valued and loved by you. I pray as we leave here today, everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. We are blessed coming in, we'll be blessed going out in Jesus' name, amen. I love you, offering baskets are at the doors.